Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers, the Carb Addiction Doc. <laughs> and I know you probably know me fairly well, but today we're going to talk about why glucose is absolutely necessary as a consumable. There are certain times when glucose is critically important to consume. The first one is in babies. Most would say definitely, absolutely under the age of one. But I would tell you probably to the age of about three or four Glucose is an important component of the diet, but not in a large amount. Not in a large amount. And when a child chooses to wean itself, part of the weaning process is I no longer need sugar in my diet. Because what ultimately a child is doing is weaning itself off breast milk. And that might happen at one year. It might happen at two years, three years, five years. But allow the child to wean itself off breast milk and when the child or milk... And when the child is no longer consuming that milk, it needs no carbohydrates. That's one. The second obvious reason is if a diabetic overdoses on insulin. If you experience a low blood sugar, consume glucose, and the best type of glucose to consume is whole milk, glucose tablets, or use glucagon to release them from your, from your liver. And we can go through that with our diabetics. But let's talk about athletes. And athletes need sugar from time to time. Okay, so the first thing is this, that, oh, sprint athletes, no, they don't. If you're a fat adapted, short burst athlete, you don't need to consume sugar, but you do then need to be fat adapted. And fat adaptation takes three to six months for an athlete to begin to become fat adapted, where you're using ketones for most of the cells in your body, but for that burst effect, you want a rush of sugar that may last anywhere from 10 seconds to about two minutes. 10 seconds to two minutes is your burst activity. And the reality is we don't really burst for much longer than that. But burst activity is mediated by a hormone called cortisol. And if you're an athlete, if you don't get anxious or stressed or... Uh, um, get a little bit tense when you're about to do a race or perform. You're depriving yourself that cortisol burst, that cortisol release of sugar from the bloodstream, at least from the liver, into the bloodstream. So cortisol in, an, in a fat-adapted athlete gives you more than enough sugar from your liver to power lift anything, to sprint 100 or 200 meters, to do what you need to do up to about two minutes of physical activity. But you want to be fat adapted. If you're not fat adapted, you don't have that sugar burst. And you want to leverage cortisol. If you're a performer on stage, you want that anxiety, you want that stress, not in a paralytic way, but in a way to give you that little rush of sugar. Because when you're performing, there are certain cells in your body that have to use sugar. So, for example, the most common one in athletes are red blood cells. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They don't have the capacity to burn fat. They are glucose obligatory users. And that's why we have to have sugar in our bloodstream, is to support the cells in our bloodstream that cannot store or use fat. And red blood cells are the commonest ones. Obviously, as an athlete, you need that oxygen carrying capacity either for during the process of your performance or right afterwards to restore uh, uh, oxygenation to your tissues, you need that burst effect. And cortisol provides that. That's the fright and flight hormone. Triggers glucagon to release that sugar. When I'm putting on my shoes to go for a run, my blood sugar will sp spike anywhere from 10 to 20 points. That's a cortisol effect, and you rely on that cortisol effect. So whether you're a performing athlete or a performer of any sort or, or needing to get that burst, you get it from your liver if you're fat adapted. The second group of athletes is that that cortisol effect, that burst, will last powerfully for a minute or two, and then it goes into the background, where you are providing some sugar for your bloodstream, but it's mostly now through glucagon, because you're not consuming anything, your insulin levels are low, and glucagon is putting a certain amount of sugar from your stores, particularly in your liver, into your bloodstream. The problem is that store, even in a highly fat adapted person who's using, whose rate of sugar use is very low, 
eventually that store gets depleted. And typically that store gets depleted. It's different for different people, but typically around the 80 to 90 minute mark. So if you're an endurance athlete, let's say you're running a marathon or you're running like Zach Bitter does. Um, I, I've had the fortune to get to know Zach. Uh, and he's just a phenomenal athlete. I mean, this guy holds the world 100 mile records. Indoor, treadmill, outdoor. Uh, guy is just ridiculously phenomenal. And Zach, when he's out on a training run, he'll run 25 miles on a Saturday to train. Guys, that's a marathon. And Zach, even though he lives in a ketogenic diet for training and for day-to-day, -day, needs sugar once his liver is getting close to depletion. So that's another reason to consume sugar, because your rate of gluconeogenesis of making sugar from other things, from protein and from fat, isn't fast enough, particularly if you're a lean-trained athlete. Now, a blob like me, whole different story. I can't run for two hours. And I've got plenty of other stores that I can tap into. So I never, never need to consume sugar when I'm doing athletic performance. Not necessary. And never means never. There's no condition under which I need sugar. I'm not diabetic. I'm still overweight. And I'm not an athlete. At least not by professional standards. And most of us fall into those categories. And yet most of us lust after sugar because we think we're some powerful endurance performing athlete. No, you're not. You're probably like me. Don't do it.